Okay, this video will finish up on the Fido and make a few concluding remarks. And this is my first round of Fido um, videos. Uh, I think later on I hope to work some more on Plato's Dialogues, but uh, for the moment I think, what is it, 17 or something's quite enough. Um, okay, Socrates' description, this is really important, of his presence in the prison about to die is the empirical example, the concrete evidence for the existence of the power of the human mind in the human soul and its natural need to control all the other powers. The reason Socrates is in the prison is not because he has a body that's made up of bones and sinews. It's not because he has a brain that has synapses and serotonin. The reason he's there is because of his idea of the good life based on his view of the underlying causes of the universe and what they imply for how human beings ought to live. The reason is also because the Athenians were threatened by his idea of the human good. The reason the Athenians chose to condemn him is not because they have bones and sinews, it's not because their brains have synapses and serotonin. It's because of their idea of the good life. It's not just because they were afraid of him and their fear caused them to have certain brain chemistry and their brain chemistry caused them to want to kill Socrates. It's because they had the wrong idea and that led to the fear. It was ignorance. Uh, human behavior is controlled by ideas, and human beings' ideas can be corrupted by pleasure and pain. But human beings are responsible for their pleasures and pains, even when there's a clear chemical composition beneath those pleasures. Certainly people eat sugar because it brings about a body chemistry that results in a pleasant feeling. But people choose whether or not to experience that feeling, knowing it's not healthy for their bodies. At every step of the way, the mind, the idea of the good life, controls or ought to, and I don't want to say control, let me say guardian, Ga are, is the guardian of people's lives, and people are responsible for the way they exercise their minds. As Aristotle would say, they have the power of choice. All, and they're responsible for their concepts of good and evil and for the choices they make. So this is all the way through tragedy. It's all the way through Plato. If the immortality of the human soul means anything, it must mean the immortality of the power of the mind, because the exercise of this power is, makes us, is what makes us who we are as rational beings and as fully developed individual members of the species of potentially rational, or I'd say noetic, because the word rationalist tends to be associated with the Enlightenment. This is wise, okay? Um, as wise human beings, as fully developed members of the species of potentially wise hum beings, if we are accountable to any gods in an afterlife, we must render an account of how we used our minds. But this part of the discussion is not used as any proof for immortality. However, it does give Socrates definitive statement for the nature of his way of life and why it's the best life. It's his defense of his way of life as the most natural and necessary human life. It explains why a philosopher would not be afraid of death because he exercised the powers of his soul in the way they were meant to be exercised, not because he knows this power will live after his body dies. This is the way of life Socrates wants to be passed down to the next generation, but it does not appear that any of the interlocutors understand. Luckily, Plato was able to grasp the nature and value of Socrates' life and pass on the philosophical version of the story to future generations. And this is where it isn't, the dialogue isn't just Phaedo's recollection of the last minutes of Socrates' life. It's Plato's description of Phaedo's 
met remembering so and Plato wasn't there so um, but of course Plato doesn't force it on you he has here's how it appeared to be and Phaedo just his description is appearances but Plato hands it to you you know uh, you can do the reversal and recognition and get it okay the last argument the biologist argument does not prove the immortality of the human soul. Again, if the argument works, it applies to all living things. Simeus and Seeds do not want to prove the soul is immortal in a way that applies to plants and animals. But the argument also explains more completely the implications of the view that forms exist as the ITI, the causes of the nature and order of material things. Briefly, Socrates describes the way concepts are ways of articulating the order inherent in the way things exist. Some concepts are opposites. Some material things can admit of opposite concepts or patterns, but never in exactly the same respect. Simias can be both great and small simultaneously, but not in the same respect. He can be greater or taller than Socrates, and smaller than Phaedo. The concepts of greatness and smallness arise because material things have magnitude, and some have more magnitude than others. Some physical things do not admit of opposites in any respect, but exist only when they possess only one of two opposites. Hotness and coldness are opposites. Fire only admits of heat, and in turn, is the cause of heat in bodies. But everything that has ever been on fire, or everything that has ever possessed fire, such as a living body, has eventually burned out. Every instantiated case of fire in a material body comes to an end. This means the form fire is eternal because it's a form. It's a definition, basically, of one part of the order of the material universe, but the definition of fire, the source of heat in a body, is such that it includes tempor temporary existence. There's no eternal flame in a material body, so the definition outlasts any particular fire, but um, every particular fire comes to an end. By analogy, the form of life does not admit the form of death because life and death are opposites. No living body is both alive and dead, but every living body is alive at one time and dead at another time. The way the forms life and death are instantiated in the world is always connected to mortality. Living things always burn out the life force within them, which also includes heat in mammals, cannot sustain itself forever over time. Again, by analogy, soul is defined as the cause of life in a physical body. The form soul, or the definition, is immortal because it's a form or a definition. But the definition of soul as the cause of life in a body implies that it can it can never last permanently over time. The thing the definition refers to never lasts permanently over time. The definition does, but what it refers to never does. Every living body eventually dies. Socrates tries to show that the human soul is immortal because soul is the cause of life in a body and hence the soul cannot die. But one can easily answer that it's not the soul that dies, it's the body that dies. This argument still does not prove what Seeves first required. What he told Socrates is he wants Socrates pr to prove that the soul cannot possibly just evaporate into smoke when the body dies, <laughs> which is this argument uh, implies that I mean, it's much stronger to say, yeah, the soul probably does evaporate into smoke after the body dies. Anyway, a table, for example, does not die. Only living bodies are said to die. 
But a table can disintegrate. Just because it does not die does not mean it exists forever. A soul also might not die, but when the body to which it gave life dies, it might simply disintegrate or break down. The argument does not definitively show that the soul, even the soul as the human mind, can outlast the death of the body which it ensouled. Every instantiated instance of a human soul, including the human mind, includes the death of the body. The claim that the soul would necessarily, necessarily survive bodily death has not been demonstrated. What has been demonstrated is what Socrates says, quote, that God and the essential form of life and the immortal in general will not perish. Okay, the unchanging patterns. This is not the sense of immortality Simeus and Thebes want. Now, now Aristotle actually thought that the power of the mind could outlive the death of the body. I, he kind of gives you the impression he thinks he knows that it does. Socrates in the Apology says, well, either it's I'm dead forever like a long sleep, or else I get to talk to all my buddies, all the Homer and all those people I wanted to talk to. In other words, if anything survives, it would be my mind. The argument explores the relationship between the ways we think about reality and the nature of the reality we're thinking about. The definition of justice, for example, can be rule for the sake of the ruled. The definition has existed since long before Plato's time and will continue to exist as long as human beings exist. But thinking human beings exist, which I assume they are, but the definition itself necessarily implies that the actual manifestations of justice only occur within a human material con context. People have to be living within a social and political context in order to not only know what power is, what it means to rule and be ruled, but also to actually experience ruling and being ruled. I can know what justice is without being just. Whether or not I'm just is determined by whether I ever have the opportunity to ex exercise power and how I actually exercise it. In order for justice to actually exist, by definition, it has to be instantiated in a uniquely human and social context. In order for the human soul to exist, it has to be instantiated in an individual person who is actually exercising the powers of the human soul. The human soul can, to some extent, be defined in a way that detaches it from any particular soul, but the definition was originally arrived at through numerous individual cases and an examination of what powers of the patterns in what powers occur in each case. Just as there can be no justice apart from people acting justly, there can be no human soul without a person exercising its powers in an existential context. This fact about the soul does not prove its immortality. This argument, again, is similar to discussions of evolutionary psychology today. Those who study the brain can argue for a high degree of complexity of the human brain. They can show that even the human brain can be altered chemically and physically by belief systems and attitudes people decide to take about the meaning of their lives. Ideas can give them power over many of the immediate physical obstacles and the suffering they experience. It can lead them to achieve great things. It can also achieve, lead them to um, do, make big mistakes and cause a lot more suffering. But these facts about the brain and the mind do not prove definitively the immortality of the human soul. So the book I read this summer by Mr. Damasio, the neurochemist, um, the neuroscientist, said there's a complete integration of brain and mind. He completely rejects the blank slate, the mind-body dualism. He rejects dualism and empirical reductionism as 
do Laszlo and I will I had some papers at the beginning of this series I have some at the end but <laughs> they still don't bring it to the next level which is you want to check out Greek uh, civilization and Greek paideia <laughs> anyway the concluding myth Socrates as guardian leading the interlocutors Simeus and Seeds appear to be satisfied with the final argument but given what has gone before they are likely to figure out the problems with it soon. Socrates has reason to worry about the future fate of philosophy. The myth he tells at the end of the dialogue can be compared to the other myths he tells at the end of other dialogues, like the Republic and the Gorgias. He's, he has failed to lead the interlocutor to the love of wisdom. He knows that the only thing is going to motivate them is irrational fears and, and pleasures. We're back in the cave, deep within the cave. The interlocutors have not been cured of their irrational desires. Socrates has to administer a myth which will use irrational motives to pursue the philosophical life or he's acting as a dialectician from the Phaedrus using the language he needs to use, or he's acting as a doctor of the soul who has to administer a pretty, pretty uh, serious uh, poison or uh, opinion that's just going to prevent them from fearing death, watching Socrates die, and refusing to, to be philosophers. Again, Socrates is clearly claiming to know what he does not know, as he did at the very beginning of the dialogue. Once again, Simeus and Seves are most impressed and comforted by such claims. The myth can be read as an allegory for what has been going on throughout the dialogue. Socrates, Simeus, and Seves' guardian spirit has led them through the hollows of the earth and the light of the pure heaven. He uses the threat of eternal reward or punishment as the ultimate reason for pursuing a philosophical life. Simeus even acknowledges that he's comforted by stories that give him hope and motivation because they promise rewards for good behavior. Just when readers are most discouraged with Simeus and Seves and most worried about the future of philosophy, Crito intervenes again wondering how they should bury Socrates after he dies. <laughs> Again, Crito shows his complete inability to appreciate philosophy. Simeus and Seves are neither as philosophical as Socrates nor as obtuse as Crito. There is still some hope. In the end, all of the distractions Socrates removed in order to conduct the discussion return. The argument shows that human beings can live complete lives and overcome distractions and obstacles. Philosophy can live on. Socrates' children return. Socrates believes they will someday understand why he lived the way he lived and died the way he died. Again, though, it's hard to know for sure. He's left their education in the hands of Crito. Uh, who clearly did not understand him. The jailer recognizes that Socrates has been unjustly accused. Politicians do, okay, the other thing is politicians do not have to be corrupt. The fact that human beings must live within a context of political and social institutions and, and those also involve, always involve the potential for abuses of power or ignorance does not necessarily imply that a philosopher will always be considered a threat to a city and ostracized or killed. Even a common person is able to recognize a person of high moral principles, like the jailer, without understanding the metaphysical principles upon which Socrates' way of life was based. Even Phaedo recognized that he was not weeping for Socrates, but for himself. The interlocutors are no longer angry at him. They just know how much they depend on him to be able to use their own minds. But they can get over it and honor Socrates by living the philosophical life. 
readers have reason to think that the way Fido has told the story indicates he did not really understand the philosophical life and the view of reality upon which it would ba be based. But readers can get what Fido did not get. The dialogue was written by Plato, after all, who supposedly was not there. He's written it to inspire readers to pick up where Fido left off. Conclusion, the relation between religion and science in the Phaedo. Alfred North Whitehead has said that the history of Western philosophy is a footnote to Plato. When applied to the Phaedo and discussions of the immortality of the soul, I would have to agree. Intellectuals of all sorts are still debating the same issues. Scientists focus on material causes and tend toward reductionism, explaining higher order thinking as if it were caused by the brain cells rather than as, as if the complexity of the brain makes it possible for people to formulate complex ideas and act on the basis of ideas. Religious leaders sometimes formulate definitions of the human soul that abstract it from the powers of the soul each human being actually exercises in his or her life. Arguments about immortality are all too often motivated by irrational desires. Those exploring the issue have an agenda, either to prove the soul's mortality or to prove the soul's immortality. Plato has given us a very honest, comprehensive, philosophical examination of the issue. The only definitive result is that every human being should aim to exercise the powers of the philosophical soul for as long as they live. If they do, they will not fear death, but will be happy with whatever the future brings to them. If they do so, they will also worry about the future of philosophy and will desire to pass on the model of the philosophical life to future generations. Both Plato and Socrates were clearly most concerned about this. Okay, and I have one other, because I have time, I will bring up Socrates' description of his second sailing. He said after he tried to study um, things in terms of material causes, he had the second way of doing things, which was to set out a theory and see what the consequences of, those, of a theory was, and then to decide if that was reasonable. Well, that's exactly what he just got done doing. That's what the Phaedo is doing. So like every other dialogue, they're all structured that way. Socrates is actually doing what it is he's talking about, um, right? In the Rep And he does it throughout. He does that same testing of theories in all of the dialogues. It's just that in the Phaedo, it's particularly evident and a lot is at stake. Um, in the Republic, he takes over at the end of book one, and he's the philosophical ruler, ruling for the well-being of the rules, but he does that throughout the dialogues. It's just more evident in that dialogue. Um, in the, in the Lakeys, um, there's, he exercises philosophical courage throughout all the dialogues. He's not afraid of an, an early death. Every day that he goes and talks to people, he knows he's risking it. But in the Lakeys, there, there's a particular focus. He also can be brave in war, but that's because he doesn't fear death. He also lives an examined life, but he also examines people. And then he has the moral courage to admit he doesn't know. So in that dialogue, it just sort of comes to a head. All aspects of courage are talked about. Um, so all the dialogues are like that, and so there's no separation. Forms are just patterns, they're ITI. You could never separate them from the universe. They're all the way we figure out what that underlying order is. Um, that's why you'd want to examine theories, because theories are about patterns, pattern recognition, and you want to examine that. Um, okay, so that's... Um, one thing I wanted to talk about. And then the last thing was um, 
that Plato's dialogues that are set before the fall of Athens are showing what the Athenians did to destroy their democracy. And in that way, um, they're, they're similar to Thucydides' uh, Peloponnesian War. Thucydides was a general who got um, discredited, kicked out, I think ostracized for something he did. But he wrote a book that he wanted to educate posterity. He wanted uh, to think about the patterns, what happened here that could easily happen again in history and again. <laughs> and so he tries to link the historical events with patterns. And he says at the beginning, I'm trying to educate future people in the future so you don't make the mistake that we made. And that's why um, I would say I call these texts Greek paideia texts. They have the same kind of characteristics like um, Aristotle describes, but um, so, and they're all trying to do reversal and recognition. They all show mistakes in judgment. People are related to each other as fellow citizens, all the, all the things. So you can read Thucydides that way. And then he famously um, has, I think it's 28 speeches of characters. And again, they aren't, necess they aren't historically completely accurate. He takes poetic license. And he just says, this is the kind of thing Alcibiades said before the assembly when he was trying to get them to go to Sicily. And this is the kind of thing Nicias said. And the Athenians mistakenly voted with Alcibiades. So, so there's a lot of um, interaction between Thucydides and Plato's dialogues. And both of them were really concerned because they thought they grew up in a good culture and then they watched it destroy itself. And again, that's why I think in this era of globalization, a lot of countries think they want to develop and become more, um, give more people opportunities for education, for exercising positions of authority, for electing rulers, um, for having more opportunity to be appointed, uh, upward mobility, and, and um, also free speech and accountability, transparency, all these wonderful things, the rule of law. But they have to learn, first of all, what sorts of institutions you need to have to really try to, to cultivate practical wisdom in people, and then you can really appreciate <laughs> what the Athenians had. And then, uh, you know, you should really worry about the fact that they lost it and they got corrupted. And you should learn those lessons about corruption. And you shouldn't develop the idea that you can get away with it, that, you know, that happened to them or that was then and this is now or it won't happen to me. And just, just get over that. And just realize, if you want to pass on a better world to the next generation, you better learn these lessons. And, of course, we're not. We have this centralization of power and denial of climate change uh, by the rich or those who are, um, what, bought out by the rich. Uh, it's really bad, the direction that we're headed right now. And um, I think I like teaching Greek things because you don't have to, you're not supposed to, you shouldn't give sermons, you shouldn't um, judge, you shouldn't uh, dictate, but you can just show people, just show people, right? Ex describe the dialogues. Ask them, you know, can you understand this? Does this fit with you, somebody you know? your leaders, um, and it really is a better system of education. It doesn't make people defensive. It doesn't make them self-righteous. Um, it just tries to start where they are, start where they are, just like Socrates did, and lead them up, or just start with a Platonic dialogue and get, get the conversation going. <laughs> um, I think the mind, I think the power of the mind exists. 
that it is dialectical, it's pure energy, it's capable of being educated, it needs to be educated because it's tied to our deepest drives and which are tied to all our other emotions and our thoughts. So we need to get it all integrated so we can have integrity. I think the interesting uh, findings by Paul Davies um, about what artificial intelligence and cognitive sciences are telling us about the mind, um, that really ideas cause ideas, and the hardware and the software are fundamentally different. That's his way of describing it. Then the neuroscientists are saying we have these neural maps. Some of them are the product of many, many uh, thousands of years of evolution, and they aren't going to change. They're embedded in the psyche although they did have to evolve, but others are more recent. And he says when problems become complex, we don't depend on something that's already been evolved. Those particular, he calls them neural maps, but we have to start creating neural maps. Our parents, of course, get kids, uh, they have certain patterns in their way of growing up, but uh, as you get older, you can deliberately change those synapses, change those maps. You can use higher order thinking to um, re-examine the patterns you've grown up with to understand those maps and to break the connections and to form different connections, <laughs> which is, you know, exactly what Plato and Aristotle say when they say you have habituation and then you have to make this transition from living by custom and habit and imitation to living by reason and truth. And then they give you this view of reality that it's possible, it's necessary. Um, this is the view underlying tragedy, Homer. Um, so, you know, I, I would like <laughs> these different groups to start talking to each other. Um, I only think of the Greek stuff as a touchstone, a beginning. Of course, as a woman, I'm very interested in um, art and art, especially that will include minorities, women, more international perspective, but the same themes, right? Um, so what does it mean that uh, someone in Indonesia or China, well, China right now, right? Um, the old people aren't treated as well as they used to be. <laughs> and so those old people could get bitter. And how are they going to deal with this? And um, and that's interesting. And, you know, the, the idea is that they should, they will be better if they overcome the suffering and they figure out a creative way to deal with whatever it is they're dealing with. Um, but anyway, and the coming of age experiences, obviously, Many young people, well, young people always have that experience, but in this complex society where they're exposed to a lot more, these experiences are more complex and more international. And um, so just take the same theme of trusting your authority figures and being um, betrayed or disillusioned um, and then having to grow beyond it, then avoiding um, avoiding allowing that to be a corrupting influence and ending up being corrupted by all those abuses of your authorities like Neoptolemus. But anyway, you could go on and on. Um, but I just wish we would have this conversation. I wish that's, that young people would get educated in a way where they can see what doesn't change in the human condition, forms, right, patterns that don't change, they're not disembodied. They're powers of the universe, the soul. They're powers that occur in, in social and political life because we need each other, and these needs are at their very base. They're the same, like need for security, things like that, uh, survival. So the patterns and how we react to when we are denied or our desire for excess, um, those, are, you know, those aren't going to go away. So that's what he means by forms. They're not disembodied. They're not abstract. Um, 
And they aren't, they're more than just definitions. They're patterns in the way people live. So Socrates gives you these, or Plato gives you these visual images through literature of what that would look like in your experience. You can't tell just by your eyes because an action, you don't know what an action is until you know why you did it. So the characters in these Paideia texts are always explaining why and they have certain kind of character traits and all that sort of stuff. So you have to learn, you always have to do a reversal and recognition from ignorance to wisdom and from appearance to reality and from just observation, the senses, to the underlying patterns. So that's enough for now.